So Crow's losses in a falling film evaporator configuration in a sugarcane factory. Stay tuned. Welcome to today's webinar. And I also want to welcome my colleague Om Katawal, who is presenting his results from the study sugar, uh, sucrose losses in the falling film evaporator configuration in a sugarcane factory. So, Omka, it's your turn. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, everyone. Today's webinar is the second in series of the falling film evaporator performance evaluation uh, study that we commenced in 2019. Sucrose losses or sucrose inversion is the hydrolysis of sucrose under acidic and mildly alkaline conditions with the magnitude of the losses depending on juice temperature, juice pH, juice composition, and juice resident time in the vessel. Undetermined sucrose losses across the evaporator station are of prime interest especially for factories which aim to reduce their exhaust steam consumption. These factories install large heating surface areas in the evaporator station to maximize vapor bleeding. Some of these evaporator types tend to have longer juice resident time in the evaporator, uh, extending uh, or increasing the extent of uh, sucrose degradation in the evaporator station. An investigation was undertaken to determine the magnitude of sucrose inversion for an evaporator station comprising entirely of BMA falling film tubular evaporators operating with low exhaust steam consumption. The measured sucrose losses determined in this study are compared to the predicted sucrose losses and the measured, measured sucrose losses in other evaporator configurations from previous investigations. Now, in the recent past, there have been several publications uh, discussing the sucrose losses occurring in different evaporator configurations, and I would like to summarize some of those references here. So, Rekman and Broadfoot in 2016 presented extensive data on measured sucrose losses across evaporator stations comprising entirely of Robert vessels in two Australian factories with different exhaust steam consumption. What they found out was that the factory with lower exhaust steam consumption had higher sucrose losses. In a further study, Rekman and Broadfoot extended the work by including more factories uh, in the study and investigating the effects of operating conditions like juice pH and uh, whether the evaporator was cleaned or scaled uh, on sucrose losses. Eggleston et al. in 2019 presented measured sucrose losses at a Louisiana sugarcane factory across different unit operations over a period of an entire crushing season. Wong et al. in 1996 presented measured sucrose losses at a Mauritius sugar factory comprising of Kestner and Robert type evaporators. The most recent one in the list and the one that is quite relevant to our study is the publication by Astani and Abdi et al. from 2020. They presented measured sucrose losses across BMA falling flame evaporator operating as a first effect at a Queensland sugar factory in Australia. The above references that I've mentioned have used different methods to determine the magnitude of sucrose losses, and I will talk about these different methods further in the presentation. The sucrose loss measurements undertaken in this study are evaluated against the sucrose loss measurements as again uh, from these references. Now, the schematic diagram shows the evaporator station operating conditions and the vapor breeding scheme uh, of the uh, evaporator station that the study was undertaken on. So the values shown are the average values from the period between 13 and 22nd December 2019. For example, clear juice at 359 cubic meter per hour and 15 degree 15% uh, bricks entering the first evaporator and syrup at 82 cubic meter per hour 
at 64% bricks exiting the last evaporator are average values over the period. The average exhaust steam consumption over the period was 32% on cane. The experimental program was undertaken from 13 to 22nd December 2019, where composite samples of clear juice, also referred to uh, as evaporator supply juice, an outlet of each falling flame evaporator was collected over a period of two hours. 24 samples were collected in the morning shift and 24 samples were collected in the afternoon shift. 192 samples were collected uh, in the complete program. The sample was transferred to 500 ml bottle and stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius. Each sample was analyzed for refractometric bricks, sucrose, glucose, and fructose. The sucrose, glucose, and fructose were analyzed by high performance gas chromatography by ECUMSA method. The flow rate of clear juice, the calendria, and vapor pressures, and all other relevant data was measured from the DCS. As mentioned in the introduction, juice resident time is an important parameter affecting the extent of sucrose losses in the evaporators. The juice resident time was estimated from calculated volumetric juice flows and the volume of juice present in the falling flame evaporators. Now, the volume of juice uh, present in the falling flame evaporator includes the juice in the bottom section, the juice in the circulation pipe, the juice present in the juice distributor and the juice present as flim on the inner circumference of the tubes. The figure on the right shows the average resident time of juice in the falling flim evaporator for, on, for each day of the test program. The total juice resident time across the entire evaporator station was 38.02 minutes. Now, to measure sucrose losses, four indicators are available uh, from the literature. The first indicator is the change in glucose per ton sucrose for that station multiplied by the ratio of molecular weights of sucrose and glucose as detailed by Purchase et al. in 1987. The second indicator is the change in glucose per ton bricks for that station multiplied by the ratio of molecular weights of glucose and sucrose and divided by the inlet purity as detailed by Schaffler et al. in 1985. The third indicator is a change in glucose person chloride for that station multiplied by the ratio of molecular weights of sucrose and glucose and divided by the inlet sucrose by chloride ratio as detailed again by Schaffler et al. in 1985. And the fourth indicator is the decrease in sucrose person dry substance for that station as detailed by Eggleston et al. in 2019. Now, Rickman and Broadford in 2016 and 17 articles used glucose person sucrose and glucose person bricks as the indicators to determine sucrose losses across the evaporator station although they preferred to use glucose person sucrose as the main method for determining the sucrose losses, arguing that uh, using glucose person sucrose uh, reduced the experimental error as both glucose and sucrose were measured in the same experimental run, as compared to glucose person bricks, which relies on two uh, different analytical methods. Wong et al. in 1996 used glucose person bricks and glucose person chloride to determine the sucrose losses across the evaporator station. At least in 2019 concluded that for higher sucrose losses, there is a possibility that even glucose is degrading and hence the glucose based indicators seem redundant at higher losses. She uh, concluded that for losses more than 0.5% Sucrose person dry substance should be used as an indicator, and for losses lower than 0.5, glucose person bricks should be used as an indicator. In this study, the measured sucrose losses are determined with glucose person sucrose and glucose person bricks indicators. 
The table on the right summarizes the measured sucrose losses using glucose percent sucrose indicator. As shown with the red, uh, uh, the figures in the red, around 67% of the overall sucrose loss results were negative. And if you combine them with the results that showed negligible losses, we have 75% of all the results showing either a negative value or a negligible value. For example, if you look at the losses across falling flame evaporator one on 13th of December, the value is 0.02. That value is quite low if uh, where we would normally expect a higher sucrose losses due to the elevated juice temperature. Now, analyzing the data again and uh, referencing the conclusions made from previous investigation, it was found that the low content of glucose can be measured more accurately and precisely than the relatively high content of glucose. In conclusion, the glucose person sucrose indicator did not prove to be useful in determining the sucrose losses in the falling flame evaporator. Now, before I present the measured sucrose losses using glucose person bricks as a sucrose loss indicator, I would, I would like to talk about the glucose person bricks value itself. So the table shows the glucose person bricks values for clear juice and outlet juice of each falling flame evaporator. The glucose person bricks values of clear juice for the each day of the test period is uh, shown in the red bracket. Now, if you uh, look uh, at the table, I have drawn a line in the middle of the program and that is just to separate the two half uh, uh, of the programs. So in the second half of the program, the glucose percent bricks values in clear juice increased on an average by 23%. Now this can be attributed to a change in cane quality or sucrose losses occurring in the earlier unit operation or a combination of both. Now the reason for pointing out this increase is that this has an effect on the measured sucrose losses, which I'll uh, talk about in the next slide. Now the increase in glucose percent bricks from clear juice to the FFE5 outlet syrup was 0.09 units. This change or this increase in glucose percent bricks from clear juice to syrup is small compared to the standard deviation of the glucose person bricks values across all the streams, which again puts additional challenge in using glucose person bricks as an indicator. So coming to the measured sucrose losses using glucose person bricks as an indicator, the table on the right summarizes the results for each falling flame evaporator and across the entire station for each day of the test program. Now, as you can see, uh, there are few results which are negative, uh, but fortunately these negative results were much smaller as a percentage of, uh, of, for, the complete, uh, of, for the complete data set. The average sucrose losses uh, across the evaporator station during the test period was 0.22%. Of the total loss, 53% occurred across FFE1 alone and 86% occurred across FFE1 and FFE2 uh, together. Now this is uh, understandable as the juice in the falling flame evaporator 1 and 2 is at much higher temperature compared to the rest of the effects. The highest loss of 0.33% were measured on the 20th and 22nd December 2019. A possible explanation uh, of these higher losses is the high glucose percent bricks of clear juice in the second half of the program, what, which I was referring to in my previous slide. So besides the measured sucrose losses through a direct indicator, there are uh, other independent but non-quantitative indicator of sucrose losses. One of such indicator um, is a pH of uh, evaporator juices. So the volatile acids formed during sucrose and subsequently glucose inversion reduce the juice pH. This reduction in pH can provide evidence of the extent of sucrose inversion. It is seen that higher the sucrose losses, greater is the reduction in juice pH. Now corresponding to the average measured loss of 0.22%, the reduction in pH from clear juice to the final evaporator syrup was 0.45 units. 
Now to put this juice pH reduction value to some perspective, Rickman and Broadford in 2016 showed a reduction in juice pH of 1.42 units from clear juice to syrup corresponding to sucrose losses of 0.85% across the evaporator station, comprising entirely of Robert evaporators. Now, for evaluating the sucrose losses across uh, uh, individual evaporator for different evaporator configurations, the table summarizes the measured sucrose losses across first, second, and third uh, effect as, as measured by previous investigations. The results from this study is shown in the last row. Now, the measured sucrose losses across FFE1 in this study agrees closely with the losses presented by Astiani Abdi in 2020 for the same size evaporator. Now, this alone increases the confidence in the measurements undertaken uh, in this study. Now, the measured sucrose losses across falling film evaporators are substantially lower than Robert and Kessner evaporators at the same position in the set. With up to 70% lower losses, across FFE1, up to 50% lower losses across FFE2, and up to 84% lower losses across FFE3. Evaluating the sucrose losses for the entire evaporator station, Rickman and Broadfoot in 2017 reported sucrose losses of 0.82% for Robert evaporators with clean tubes these losses increased to 1.27% when the tubes were scaled due to the increase in juice resident time in the evaporator as a result of the lower juice processing capacity of the set. Eglustin et al. in 2019 reported 1.84% sucrose losses across the evaporator station, largely due to the high resident time in pre-evaporators. These pre-evaporators have large heating surface areas and they supply vapor to the triple effect, to the juice heaters, and to the pan stage. Now, if you compare all of these losses to the losses measured across falling flame evaporators in this study of 0.22%, they are substantially lower than the sucrose losses which is occurring in the Robert evaporator. All right, so uh, in terms of predicted sucrose losses, the predicted sucrose losses are estimated from the Vukov 1965 empirical equation. The predicted sucrose losses for this study are shown in the uh, table on the right, along with the measured sucrose losses for each day. Now, it is seen that the predicted sucrose losses are considerably lower than the measured sucrose losses, with the average predicted sucrose losses across the test program being 0.11%. Uh, as compared to the major sucrose losses being almost twice as that. If you look at the difference between the predicted sucrose losses and the major sucrose losses for individual days, sometimes the major sucrose losses are three times that of the predicted losses. So it is clear that the application of the Vukov expression seems to have some limitations. Ashtani Abdi uh, et al. in 2020 uh, presented predicted and measured sucrose losses across a BMA falling flame evaporator operating as first effect. And they also uh, found the same trend and same values as found in this study. As in, even uh, for them, the measured sucrose losses were higher than the predicted sucrose losses. Now, it is believed based on uh, the results from this study and other investigation that the actual sucrose losses would be closer to the measured sucrose losses of 0.22 percent. Now, the reason between the difference between uh, the uh, uh, predicted and measured sucrose losses uh, is not clear. Rickman and Broadford in 2016 and 17 showed that the predicted sucrose losses were greater than the measured sucrose losses. Um, this is in contrast to what we have found where the uh, measured sucrose losses are greater than the predicted sucrose losses. Rickman and Broadfoot stated that the difference between the predicted sucrose losses and the measured sucrose losses was greater when green cane or immature cane was processed or evaporator tubes were scaled. Eglistin et al. in 2019 recommended 
modifying the Vukov expression to incorporate a scaling component to improve the simulations. The difference between the predicted and the measured sucrose losses for any configuration could be due to a combination of the factors which are listed below. The first one being that the predicted sucrose losses are underestimated. So the Vukov expression was developed on pure sucrose solution and does not consider the catalytic effects of salt and inverse sugar on sucrose inversion. So if you do end up in a situation where you have a high impurity uh, uh, in, the, in the clear juice stream entering the evaporator, the Vukov expression is unable to pick up on, on that effect. And hence you could be uh, measuring higher losses across the evaporator while the predator losses would be underestimated. The juice resident time uh, in the evaporator is estimated from the evaporator juice flows and the static liquid level when it's an uh, uh, rising flame evaporator uh, is uh, 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 and the juice resident time is calculated. Now this value could be inaccurate, especially if you have two or more vessels operating as parallel. For higher sucrose losses, uh, it is seen that, uh, or it is uh, considered that even glucose is degraded. And hence, glucose percent uh, bricks or glucose percent uh, sucrose indicators seem redundant uh, uh, at, at such scenarios. So, uh, in such scenarios where you would be having higher sucrose losses, but the major sucrose losses would be underestimating, uh, or the, uh, the indicators would be underestimating the, uh, the actual sucrose losses. And lastly, the measurement of sucrose losses is prone to experimental errors, uh, including during sample collection, sample preparation, sample storage, and the experimental error uh, associated with the analytical method. And the one thing that we have uh, uh, learned from, from this study is, is that it is extremely difficult to uh, measure sucrose losses uh, uh, across uh, uh, evaporators or for any station uh, uh, for that matter. Uh, it takes a lot of skill, a, a, a lot of practice with um, a, a sophisticated methods like chromatography uh, to get uh, repetitive results. So, um, measuring sucrose losses across uh, any station is, are, uh, is, is very difficult. Lastly, to understand the impact of sucrose losses on sugar production and revenue losses, a simple example is simulated. Consider a cane sugar factory. Uh, with a crushing capacity of 10,000 tons per day. The factory is operating for 160 days and processes, processes a cane of pole content of 14%. The clear juice purity is 86%. The factory undertakes extensive vapor bleeding from the evaporator station to reduce exhaust steam consumption. Two scenarios are considered. In case one, the evaporator station comprises entirely of Robert evaporator and consequently, the sucrose losses across the station uh, is 1%. And in case two, the evaporator station comprises entirely of BMA falling flame evaporators, and consequently, the sucrose losses uh, across the station is 0.22%. Now, considering similar boiling house efficiency in both the cases, in case one, we have 2,200 ton per annum of less sugar produced as a result of 1% sucrose loss across the evaporator station. In case two, we have 500 ton per annum less sugar produced due to 0.22% uh, sucrose losses across the evaporator station. Considering a raw sugar price of uh, 400 USD per ton and a molasses price of 150 USD per ton, the net increase in revenue for a factory operating with falling flame evaporators would be 650,000 US dollars for each crushing season. Summarizing the conclusions from this study, an experimental program was undertaken to determine the extent of sucrose losses for an evaporator station comprising entirely of BMA falling flame evaporators. A total of 192 samples were collected and analyze for sucrose, glucose, and fructose using high performance gas chromatography. Juice resident time across the evaporator station was estimated to be 38.02 minutes. The measured sucrose losses based on change 
uh, in glucose person bricks uh, were used uh, to calculate the uh, across each falling film evaporator. On average, the glucose person bricks increased by 0.09 units across the complete evaporator station, which corresponds to a sucrose loss of 0.22%. These losses were measured after FFE1 and FFE2 had been in operation for 29 days. Decline in juice pH of 0.43 units across the station indicate similar magnitude of losses. The measured sucrose losses across falling flame evaporators are considerably lower than the Robert evaporator configuration, both operating with extensive vapor bleeding to reduce exhaust steam consumption. These reduced sugar, sucrose losses reflect in additional sugar production. When factories are uh, considering to upgrade the evaporator station, the return on investment calculation needs to incorporate the increased revenue due to reduce sucrose losses across falling flame evaporators. The complete set of results undertaken uh, uh, in this study is published as a referred paper at the 93rd South African Sugar Technologies Association Congress 2021, which was held virtually earlier this week. The paper will be available on the SASTA website for downloading soon. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Omka, so much for presenting us these insightful results of the study. Um, and then we will start with the Q&A part. So, now it's your turn to uh, send us your questions uh, for this presentation. And I will start with the uh, with one comment to your presentation and um, maybe you can give us your opinion to this one. Um, the extra sucrose loss due to scaling is the sum of two impacts, higher residence time in evaporators and catalytic, catalytic impact of scale on the sucrose hydrolysis inversion reaction. Well, I, I agree to the, uh, uh, let's say, half of the comment that the, um, the increased sucrose losses for, due to scaling is because of the uh, higher uh, resident time of the juice in the evaporator because the processing capacity of the evaporator has reduced. Um, although I don't uh, really uh, agree that the scale itself has a catalytic effect, um, I have not seen uh, any evidence that would suggest that is uh, uh, occurring. Or, um, but if the person who's asking this question has uh, that uh, evidence or the reference, I would be. Uh, it would be great to see that. Yeah, thanks. Okay, then let's go to the next one. Uh, what is the correct uh, or good tube length of FFE of any size, 1,000 to 6,000 square meters? The tube length, uh, uh, yes. Uh, again, the, the length of the tube would definitely have an impact on uh, on the juice resident time and the overall operation of the falling flame evaporator. Uh, for cane sugar factories, uh, one thing uh, you, you also, we also have to keep in mind that these evaporators have to be cleaned quite often, sometimes um, every week or every at least every two weeks for them to uh, you know, have this high heat transfer coefficients, um, especially at the later stage of the uh, set. Uh, increasing the tube length uh, uh, beyond a particular point uh, makes it difficult for the cleaning of these tubes and hence uh, uh, we don't really uh, increase it. But we do have uh, for BMA falling film evaporators, we have a fixed tube length that we operate for cane sugar factories, um, but uh, I, I wouldn't be able to tell the tube length uh, at this uh, in this forum right now. Okay, so if you do need any more information for this question, just let us know and we will answer it um, afterwards. Uh, the next one, what was the uh, average clear juice pH? The drop in pH due to the cross loss across the evaporators will be higher if the higher clear juice pH. Uh, the average clear juice pH uh, in this study, I think we had around 6.9 to 7. That was the range of the clear juice pH over the uh, over the uh, experimental program. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yes, I, I do agree that the higher the clear juice pH, uh, uh, the lower would be the, the drop in uh, 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 the pH across the set. So yes, I do agree with that. So um, the pH or average of 7 pH is what we had and we saw a drop of 0.43 units. We did see uh, a larger drop uh, uh, even for uh, lower losses, but uh, this thing, so the data was scattered as I was shown uh, in, in, in the presentation. Uh, but yes, for I do agree with the person who's asked this question that uh, with a higher pH, there would be a lower drop, yes. Okay, so I have another one for you. Um, how have you accounted for the destruction of glucose and contribute to bricks? 
Does this analysis gives the right picture? Well, uh, that's w w what I've said in my uh, 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 in my presentation, especially from Eggleston et al. in 2019, where she said that if there are uh, if the conditions are such that you are destroying a lot of sucrose, then uh, there's a possibility that you're also destroying glucose. And uh, the way that you are measuring the sucrose loss is by accounting for the glucose. But if glucose itself is getting destroyed, that means your the whole uh, point of that indicator is redundant. So uh, we don't, uh, uh, we have not measured the glucose destroyed in the this thing. We are hoping that what, uh, because of the low, lower losses in, in this study, we uh, expect or we hope that glucose was not being destroyed because uh, the likelihood of sucrose dist being destroyed itself was quite low. So even glucose was not destroyed, but there is a method of calculating the uh, destruction of glucose and that is given by the Schaffler et al. Uh, 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 reference where he accounts for the difference in sucrose losses by including the effect of glucose degradation. So you can look up that reference. It should tell you uh, what you're looking for. OK, let's go back to the retention time. Uh, one participant wants to know what should be the optimum retention time of juice in the separator to have minimum sucrose loss. Uh, OK, the optimum retention time, uh, again, uh, retention time in the evaporator or the falling flame evaporator uh, is a combination of, of a lot of things. As I said, it's, it's the juice present uh, in the bottom section, it's the juice present in the in the circulation tube, it's the juice present in the distributor, and all of these contribute individually to the resident time. Uh, uh, we, the, well, the, our aim is to have a good recirculation or good distribution of juice through all the tubes. Um, and hence uh, uh, to uh, have a good operation at the same time have lower uh, resident time in the uh, uh, evaporator. Uh, there is no fixed uh, resident time of, of particular uh, uh, or in the one part of the uh, falling flame evaporator that I would be able to describe it here. Uh, but if the person wants to uh, ask no more about uh, individual resident time, he can email me later. And we can discuss it, yes. OK, so then there's the last one. Uh, Quintable set uh, semi-Kestner as first effect and remaining all rubber type found only 45 minutes only. Difference only seven to eight minutes, then how sucrose loss will be 1%. The the one percent sucrose loss that I mentioned in my, uh, uh, in my presentation and in my article is for a evaporator station comprising entirely of robot evaporators. What the other person is saying uh, is the evaporator set is comprising of a semi Kessner, which is a much narrower uh, 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 vessel as compared to a robot evaporator, and hence it has a lower juice resident time. Uh, so uh, I don't think that is comparable to uh, uh, a complete set of robots. So uh, my uh, uh, comparison of falling flume evaporator complete set uh, and our, uh, was to a robot evaporator complete set of and the sucrose losses being in the robot set being one percent. Yeah. So then uh, we answered all the questions. If you do have any more questions, just uh, simply let us know. Thank you so much, uh, Omkar, for sure. presenting these results today. So please subscribe to our YouTube channel, subscribe to LinkedIn, then you will miss no more webinars. Um, then have a good day. See you next time.